but welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Barbara Wall from the Office for Mission and Ministry, and I'm uh, delighted that you're all here today. Before we uh, begin, we will begin as we begin all wonderful things that go on over with a prayer. And I ask Father Joseph Farrell from the Office of Mission and Ministry uh, to give us a blessing. Jesus announces in the Gospel of John, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. O oh God, we gather in your name this day and light a candle as a symbol of the light you are to the world and that light which illumines the faith we profess with our lives. You are the source of the light which shines in our lives so that what we profess with our hearts is made real with our lives. Inspire us to discover how we bring your light to the world around us. In those areas of our world and personal lives where your light is difficult to see, help us to become as inspired as St. Augustine when he read in the garden Paul's letter to the Romans, throw off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. We are about to begin a year of faith. Let our gathering this day ignite the light of faith in our minds and hearts so that your light shines brightly from our faithful lives. We ask for your blessing upon our university community we ask for your blessing upon this ceremony. We ask for your blessing upon those who will speak and upon our honoree, Professor McIntyre. Help us always to be grateful for your light and your blessing in our lives. We ask this blessing in the name of Jesus, the light of the world. Amen. 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 St. Augustine, pray for us. all for being here today. A special day for us as we inaugurate the Kiwitas Day Medal and honor its first recipient, Professor Alastair McIntyre. I want to take just a few minutes to share with you what this medal signifies for our community. Over the last 12 years, we as a university, and in particular, the Office of Mission and Ministry, I focused our attention on retrieving and renewing our Catholic Augustinian intellectual and moral history and identity because we believe its richness and intellectual substance <laughs> is a most valuable tool for navigating a world of complexity and ambiguity. The scope of Catholic intellectual tradition stretches over two millennia and extends beyond the theological and philosophical traditions to include literary writings, art, design, and scientific contributions. It encompasses a sacramental view of reality and human experience, seeking to uncover and proclaim the deepest meaning of the universe and human experience. It was about two years ago that I suggested such an award in order to give prominence to this tradition, honor those who have made significant contributions to the tradition, and lastly, those who inspire others to continue the enrichment of the tradition. In his seminal work on the city of God, St. Augustine articulates a distinctive commitment to intellectual engagement between the church and the world. <coughs> With the Kiwitas Dei Medal, Yvonne Nova University seeks to recognize Catholics who through their work have engaged the church and the world, faith and reason, and have made exemplary contributions to the Catholic intellectual tradition, 
and have shown particular commitment to the pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness. In the words of St. Augustine in Kiwitas Dei, Book 14, Chapter 28, we read, What we see then is that two societies have issued from two kinds of love. Worldly society has flowered from a selfish love which dare to despise even God, whereas the communion of saints is rooted in the love of God. In a word, this latter relies on the Lord, whereas the other boasts that it can get along by itself. The city of man seeks the praise of men, whereas the height of glory for the other is to hear God in the witness of conscience. The one lifts up its head in its own boasting. The other says to God, Thou art my glory, thou liftest up my head. In the city of the world, both the rulers themselves and the people they dominate are dominated by the lust for domination, whereas in the city of God, all citizens serve one another in charity, whether they serve by the responsibilities of office or by the duties of obedience. The one city loves its leaders as symbols of its own strength. The other says to its God, I love thee, O Lord, my strength. In the city of God, there is no merely human wisdom, but there is a piety which worships the true God as he should be worshipped and has as its goal that reward of all holiness, whether in the society of saints on earth or in that of the angels of heaven, which is that God may be all in all. End of quote. In the words of St. Augustine, which I just stated, we see the relevance of his wisdom and direction for us in our world today. The Kibitas Day Medal retrieves St. Augustine's quest to renew the city of earth with a vision and a faith in what this world can become. I'm grateful to all the members of the Mission and Ministry Strategic Planning Committee who worked on this project including Dr. Bernard Prusak, the Theology and Religious Studies Department, for suggesting the title of the medal that would reflect our Augustinian tradition, and to Dr. Christian Osik, who handled the design and crafting of the medal. The symbol that we have is from one of the stained glass windows in the main church. And if later you come up and you look at the banners over here, the banners are banners that depict the stained glass windows in the church. And the one of Augustine, the teacher, up in the left-hand corner, the top, is the symbol that's on this medal. So we took that symbol and had it crafted as the medal. And it reads, De Kiwitate Dei, on the city of God. As you can see, the stained glass window, which the stained glass window of Augustine from our main church. You'll see them in October when they line Ryan's way for Augustinian Heritage Month. Now lastly, I, will, I would like to introduce our panelists who will share their views on why Professor McIntyre is such a worthy candidate for this award. The panelists were either students of Dr. McIntyre, they're certainly all domers, and I hope you all know what that means, <laughs> some significant connection to Notre Dame. Uh, or they have been mentored by his work, certainly they all use his work in their classes. Um, each of these panelists, and I, I will begin with the, who they are by order of their presentations. Michael Moreland. <coughs> Vice Dean of the Villanova University School of Law, Peter Wicks, Catherine of Cielo Fellow in the Ethics Program, John Duty, the Robert M. Birmingham Chair in Humanities, and Thomas Smith, the Ann Quinn Welsh Endowed Chair and Director of the Honors Program. So please, uh, let's give a, a round of applause for our panelists who work very diligently. Thank you, Barbara. I hope each of you, and I'm especially speaking to the undergraduates here, can someday look back on your life and say that you had a truly great teacher, a teacher who changed your life. 
The greatest teacher I ever had was Alistair McIntyre. McIntyre is among the most famous philosophers in the world. He's one of the towering intellectual figures of the age, persistently challenging well-settled views and assaulting pious platitudes. But McIntyre has for some 60 years been foremost a teacher, a teacher in classrooms, in Notre Dame, of course, and elsewhere, but also a teacher through his many books and articles, through contributions to academic philosophy and contributions to the wider intellectual culture. You never know what you'll learn from encountering McIntyre. I remember, for example, he once told our class, I think we were discussing Kant at the time, that we should make certain that anyone we might consider a prospect for marriage adequately appreciates Ernest Hemingway's novel, The Sun Also Rises. I was never sure and didn't ask why any prospective fiancés should be scrutinized about their views on a novel about expatriates in Paris traveling to the running of the bulls in Pamplona. <laughs> but a few years later, after I had left Notre Dame and was in graduate school in Boston, I started dating someone, and I was thinking about asking her to marry me. So one day I asked her, out of the blue, if she liked Ernest Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises. <laughs> Fortunately, she said she did, and my wife and the mother of our four children came right over there. <laughs> what has McIntyre taught those of us who are his students? How can we learn how to learn what McIntyre has to teach? McIntyre teaches us that learning how to learn is an insignificant part of the process of self-discovery. It is through asking questions about our good and the company of our friends, asking about the good of our communities, that we come to learn about the good life for human beings, in families and neighborhoods, in fishing crews, to use a favorite example of his, and in universities, even in a law school. This emerges from the profound central claim of After Virtue, a book that dramatically and fundamentally altered the landscape of contemporary ethics. That claim is that it is only from a perspective alien to modern culture, Aristotelianism, that we can make sense of our moral lives. And to be an Aristotelian is in part to know that the role of teachers is to bring their students to self-understanding. As Jonathan Lear notes, the point of the Nicomachean ethics is not to persuade us to be good or to show us how to behave well in the various circumstances of life. It is to give people who are already leading a happy, virtuous life insight into the nature of their own souls. The aim of the ethics is to offer its readers self-understanding, not persuasion or advice. We learn from our best teachers not merely information about this or that subject, but we come to recognize our own good and pursue it in its many forms. On account of our teachers, we come to know the truth about ourselves. We come to know the nature of our souls. To this Aristotelian insight about self-understanding, McIntyre teaches us to add, by way of correction and completion, Augustinian Christianity. We are honoring McIntyre today at a university sponsored by the Augustinian Order and bestowing upon him a word named for one of Augustine's most famous words. For Augustine, too, we learn from our teachers by way of self-understanding and by submitting ourselves to the authority of a teacher. As McIntyre writes about Augustinian education, I'm quoting here from uh, three rival versions, moral and Greek, by accepting authority, one acquires a teacher who both introduces one to certain texts and educates one into becoming a sort of person capable of reading those texts with understanding, texts in which such a person discovers the story of him or herself. And so it is especially fitting that we honor Alistair McIntyre today at a university in which such texts, primarily Augustine's Confessions, have a central place in the education of students. Furthermore, McIntyre follows Augustine and Aquinas in teaching us that the end of our self-reflection and understanding the culmination of our inquiry into our good is God. In his recent book, God, Philosophy, Universities, McIntyre summarizes Augustine's account, and I'm quoting here from that book, to achieve self-understanding and self-knowledge, and also it will turn out knowledge of God, we therefore have to turn within. We are only able to move within ourselves so that we become aware of our true nature and transcend ourselves if we receive from God by grace the means to do so. Otherwise, the path to self-knowledge is closed to us. Why so? What deprives us of the knowledge of God also deprives us of self-knowledge, an indefinite capacity for distraction by external trivialities, and a craving for self-justification, so that we either do not attend to what is within, or if we do, disguise from ourselves our thoughts and motives. It is God alone who can rid us of the pride and the desire that is at work in these various agencies of self-deception." Learning how to learn about God and being in the presence of teachers who help us to come to know God can change your life. We are apt to suppose that believing in God is some additional piece of information we can be taught about 
alongside, say, <clears throat> prime numbers, the composition of stars, the rules of civil procedure, or the historical causes of the First World War, and to that we add God. But to borrow from one of McIntyre's friends, the English Dominican Herbert McCabe, we know of God not by understanding him, but by recognizing that there are questions which impose themselves on us, to which we reach out to answer, but cannot yet. Coming to know that God is, that we are part of stories not of our own making, in a world created from nothing and redeemed, is not just another thing we happen to learn about. And so when we come to believe in God, the characteristic response is gratitude. Gratitude for the many blessings of our lives, gratitude for the strength to endure our trials, and gratitude for our teachers. We are grateful to teachers living and dead, to teachers we encounter in life, and to teachers we encounter only on the written page. We are most grateful to those teachers who helped us come to know ourselves and help us come to know God. And so I join the generations of students of his and simply say to Alistair, thank you. idea that um, somebody could say anything in just a few minutes that would begin to convey the scope and significance of Alistair McIntyre's contributions to modern philosophy is so patently absurd that when I sat down to write these opening remarks, I immediately thought of the Monty Python sketch about the Summarize Proust competition, in which contestants are given 15 seconds to summarize Marcel Proust's seven-volume masterpiece and every shirt of Tom Perdue. Um, I'm going to attempt something slightly less impossible than summarizing McIntyre, I hope to take a few minutes to, to try and convey some of the reasons why his work both has been and continues to be not only an important contribution to moral philosophy, but a very radical challenge to the dominant self-understanding of moral philosophy. The primary focus of my remarks will be on After Virtue, and this is not just because After Virtue is McIntyre's best known work, but also because it's the central work. Um, both chronologically and more importantly in the sense that it's a work in which um, lines of inquiry developed over 30 years converge and from which uh, the extraordinary sequence of works of the last three decades derive. The opening chapter of After Virtue, the opening chapters of After Virtue argue that modern moral disagreements present us both with a problem and a puzzle. The problem is that our deepest moral disagreements, disagreements about war, abortion, and the requirements of justice concerning the distribution of wealth and resources, can be seen on careful analysis to derive from disagreements that go all the way down to the level of first principles. And we lack any rationally compelling arguments that will allow us to decide between the rival premises on which our moral conclusions rest. Consequently, the shrillness of so much modern moral debate testifies to the fact that we are at least partially aware that on the one hand, we can be confident our positions will never be rationally refuted, but on the other hand, we'll never be able to give a rationally compelling argument that will convince our interlocutors who, dis who disagreements with us are so profound. And our inability to give such arguments mean that we lack such arguments even for ourselves, and corresponding to our inability to give others rational reasons is the disquieting possibility that we lack rational reasons for holding our own convictions. Now this is a very serious problem, but it also has a corresponding puzzle. For if it really is the case that moral disputes can't be resolved through rationally decisive arguments, why do we continue to attempt to make such arguments? Indeed, how did we first acquire the expectation that such arguments would be available to us, and that moral disagreements would be resolvable through rational argument? Why do we continue to reach for arguments that will justify our moral beliefs, rather like an amputee reaching for a phantom limb? McIntyre argues that the situation is only comprehensible when it's recognized as a result of a very particular history. And one of the primary goals of After Virtue is to vindicate that claim by providing that history. On McIntyre's account, our current state of moral confusion and disorder is the aftermath of the collapse of the Christian Aristotelian framework of ethical thought and the failure of various subsequent attempts by Enlightenment thinkers to provide rational justification for the precepts that originated in that context, which have now been removed from the framework in which they took their sense and purpose. While McIntyre has developed and refined the historical narrative of after virtue in subsequent works, its essential contours remain unaltered. And needless to say, this history was and is highly controversial. What I wish to stress, though, 
is that if McIntyre's diagnosis of the origins of our modern moral confusion is correct, then the techniques of both analytic philosophy and phenomenology will be equally impotent to recognize the origins of a moral disorder. Indeed, they will not even be able to recognize it as disorder, since they'll necessarily be oblivious to the order that has been lost. They lack the resources even to assess after virtue central contention. And so one of the lessons of after virtue is the moral philosophy requires to be historically reformed, informed. Now, in the present day, a great deal of high quality work is produced in the history of moral philosophy. But increasingly, this work is the work of specialists and consumed by other specialists. And some take the specialization to be a sign of philosophical progress. In a recent history of philosophical analysis of the 20th century, Scott Soames writes that philosophy has changed substantially in the last 30 or so years. Gone are the days of large central figures whose work is accessible and relevant to, as well as read by, nearly all analytic philosophers. Philosophy has become a highly organized discipline done by specialists, primarily for other specialists. And I should stress that in Soames' telling, this is a history of progress. So for Soames, this is developed to be welcomed, a sign that philosophy has finally become a mature research science, well suited to flourish in the ecosystem of the modern research university. But if McIntyre is correct, then this culture of hyper-specialization is a disaster and makes impossible philosophy's essential purpose as an integrative discipline. Indeed, it attacks the integrity of the discipline itself. Now, those who wish to defend the importance of the history of philosophy for the practice of philosophy will generally emphasize the continuity of philosophical concerns from ancients through to the moderns. But the importance of philosophy on McIntyre's account lies as much in the discontinuities of that history as in the continuities. One of the most important lessons we learn from the reading of Plato and Aristotle is their questions are not our questions, and the concepts in which they're framed are not ours. So, moral philosophy requires the history of moral philosophy. But there's a more radical claim, which is that moral philosophy requires history simpliciter. Indeed, as McIntyre writes, there ought not to be two histories, one of political and moral action and one of political and moral theorizing, because there were not two pasts, one populated only by actions, the other only by theories. And so the true radicalism of this thesis is that philosophers need to read not only Plato and Aristotle, but Homer and Sophocles, and indeed a great deal of social and cultural history besides. So I hope it's beginning to become clear why this position is so antithetical to the culture of specialization which figures like Soames seek to celebrate. I wish to say finally something about the positive thesis of after virtue, because one of the great slanders of the book is that it is the source of modern virtue ethics. But much of modern virtue ethics is really little more than the anemic caricature of textbooks, where problems are confronted by asking, what would a virtuous person think about this? What would a virtuous person do? Would they perform vivisection? Would they perform insider trading? And so on. Um, the real radicalism of after virtue, its positive thesis, is an attempt to say we need not just to recover virtue, but Aristotelianism, in a very full-blooded sense. Now, my focus has been on the impact of after virtue on academic moral philosophy, but I'd be remiss if I didn't note the extraordinary impact the book has had elsewhere. And it's extraordinary for a book in the present day of moral philosophy to be read by a wide readership. It's a difficult and demanding book. And so this suggests that the reason why much modern moral philosophy is not read is not that it's difficult and demanding, but rather that it doesn't speak to people's concerns and sense of life. And for all the demands of the book makes of the reader, there is for many people a strong resonance with a sense of lived experience. Let me suggest that one of the reasons why the readership of the book has become so large is that central contention is true. That Aristotelianism just, is just what its defenders have always claimed it is, the morality of common sense. Not in the sense that its views are obvious or self-evident, but in the sense that they are continually rediscovered in our practical lives, even in situations in which the dominant ideology and social structures are indisputable. So I think the importance of after virtue, in short, is that it is a sense that we can not just return to virtue, but go forward with Aristotle. Thank you. I won't be speaking about Professor McIntyre's contributions to political theory in the past 60 years. 
And I'm going to take for the focus that the position he has staked out as a critic of modernity. And I want to begin by emphasizing the uh, centrality of the claim that he makes in After Virtue, where he says, every moral philosophy characteristically presupposes a sociology. For if modern moral theory, as Peter was just mentioning, is in the state depicted by Professor McIntyre, then its underlying sociology must also be held responsible. Uh, next, I will sketch the two major roads that Professor McIntyre has taken in his philosophical journey and how they have come to influence the work that he produced. Those roads, as we know them, are Marxism and Christianity. The modernity of which we speak here is a secular political liberalism, which does not know that it is but the political moral expression of emergent capitalism. Specifically, we can identify two of the major characters in this liberalism. First is the concept of the autonomous liberal individual, an abstract entity as it exists in civil society. The latter appears as the modern nation state, which owes much of its legitimation from its governance of global capital markets, even though those markets in turn govern them. It's important to note here that the rule of law in the modern nation state is grounded in positive law, not the human law of Aquinas, which itself is a reflection of natural law. And after virtue, we found three of the major characters of modern sociology. First, we have the bureaucratic manager operating in Weberian fashion, making his or her key choices on the basis of instrumental reason, ungrounded by any account of final goals. Next, we have the therapist, who is responsible for enabling these abstract consumers of desire to pursue their ambitions. And finally, we have Kierkegaard's esteem, whose only goal in life is satisfying his or her will while staving off boredom. Now, whose sociology is this? I would say it's the sociology of the unencumbered self. And here we mean unencumbered in the sense of not unencumbered by one's traditions, one's practices, or one's dependent relationships. It's the sociology presupposed by the self of John Rawls, who asks us to put aside our identity so as to discover the true principles of justice. This fictitious self, the autonomous self of the Enlightenment program, from Hobbes and Locke to Smith and Kant, claims to be able to wander through the vicissitudes of life, armed either with a certain knowledge possessed by our instrumentally effective bureaucratic manager, or bearing the uncertainty which causes our needs for therapeutic cleansing, all the while acting out one's particular preferences in an aesthetic manner. This sounds something to me like an episode of Mad Men meets Sex of the City. <laughs> The road taken and the road and the road of return. One could fairly say that much of Professor McIntyre's entire career has been taken up with the contrasting and conflicting worldviews of Marxism and Christianity. It's worth noting here, for the record, that his first publication nearly 60 years ago was Marxism Interpretation, which he later republished in 1968, retitling it as Marxism and Christianity. McIntyre has written often about his own intellectual journey as a sympathetic reader of Marxism, especially in the 1950s. He has chronicled the events of that time, including the repudiation of Stalin, the violent rejection of the Hungarian uprising in 1956, and the emergence of a state capitalist economy. As his journey led him to see the systematic failings of Marxism in practice, in hindsight you could come to say that without an adequate ethics, there can be no adequate politics and there was none for him to see in the practice of Marxism, which would alternatively, in his own practice, justify itself with either Benthamite utilitarianism, while others would echo Kant. Yet, McIntyre has always remained sympathetic to the writings of the young Marx, particularly citing the theses of Feuerbach as a potential blueprint or template for reimagining social relations. Indeed, there are striking similarities between McIntyre's Aristotelian account of human practices and Marx's visionary remarks on the nature of the human essence in those theses on far back, particularly the sixth one, where Marx writes that the human essence is not given by considering the properties of individuals in isolation, but rather in reality, the human essence is the ensemble of social relations. McIntyre's return to Christianity was mediated by his rediscovery of the power of the Aristotelian worldview, something which both Peter and Michael have mentioned. In particular, the ability of this worldview to provide an alternative stance within which it could understand and thereby by be able to diagnose the ills of modernity, which ills modernity on its own account is unable to discover. Thus was after virtue. 
As he has said, he first had to become an Aristotelian before he could appreciate Aquinas' development of Aristotle. Thomas, he has argued, in some cases, is an even better Aristotelian than Aristotle was himself. And with this rediscovery, McIntyre came to see Catholic Christianity as offering the best template for moving beyond the ills of modernity. McIntyre uh, reminds us, however, in Who's Justice with Rationality, that Aquinas' 13th century accomplishment was, in fact, the re reconciliation of what at that time were seen as two rival traditions, the classical Aristotelian one and the Augustinian one, which at that time was a predominant voice in the medieval world. The sociologies offered by Aristotle, Augustine, and Aquinas present us with a starkly different vantage point from which to judge our human condition. The ateleological worldview of the Enlightenment, where men and women make themselves, is replaced by the return to a teleological understanding of human action and desires. Human act, humans act for a reason, and that reason is always understood as a good. And all human action to be successful must be acted out in the larger perspective of a common good, which informs individual decisions and actions. Politics here is the art, conversation, and argumentative process whereby we seek out our own individual goods within the greater framework of our shared common goods. For McIntyre, this is the politics that frees us from our alienated and isolated individualism as we discover how our fractured selves, as Augustine always wants to remind us, can only find healing by the search for the common good which defines us all. Augustine, of course, in his own case, used mostly theological language and wanted to situate our rational dependence on others as a function of our, as a, our being radically dependent as creatures. McIntyre's political account echoes Aristotle, emphasizing our radical dependence on our animality and situates our animality within the social context, traditions, practices, and understandings that we inherit. It is crucial to note here that all of our historically bound perspectives are open to rational discourse and dialogue within the search for this common good. And Mike wants to say here that McIntyre, in this sense, continues to employ the dialectic of the feminine critique found in others. Finally, regarding the criticism that his return to, to a mystic Aristotelianism renders him a nostalgic reactionary, he, McIntyre, in a recent address, takes up this charge. The Enlightenment values of freedom, equality, and dignity of individuals has had a profound effect when used in the struggle against the ancient regime's employment of its arbitrary power. The problem, he argues, is that while these key Enlightenment values function as powerful negative critique, they have not been successfully used in a positive sense, nor will they, as long as liberal modernity does not recognize a teleology for human action. For it is his assertion that a genuine political discourse must ultimately be grounded on the search for our common good and end. So I know I'm the only thing that stands between you and McIntyre's talk, so I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, and it's an honor to share this stage with uh, my distinguished colleagues and friends and, and with Professor McIntyre. So my job is to give an account of Professor McIntyre's contribution to Catholic higher education, which is obviously impossible with the time I have. So I'm going to focus on one contribution that's meant a great deal to me as an academic administrator in trying to influence some of the programs that I've led at Villanova. And this consists in the way that Professor McIntyre asks us to rethink how we usually approach the question of what it means to be a Catholic university. A few years ago, I was in a lecture McIntyre gave, and the example he used made me think differently about our situation. So in this lecture, he asked his audience to imagine a group of faculty and students on a service trip to Haiti. He asked us to imagine that one of the students notices a strange pattern of destruction in the buildings in Port-au-Prince as she returns from her service at the end of the day. And the student asks her professors if they can help explain this strange pattern. The political science professor pursues a hypothesis that there's a correlation between greater levels of destruction and pockets of more severe poverty. The geologists examine the soil and rock formation under the different areas of the city to see if that reveals anything. The engineer looks at the construction of the buildings that fell, and the economist looks at the influence of economic factors and so on. All this is important and interesting in what you, what you would expect. But what if, after all this research, the faculty members don't share with each other, in common, with the student, what they've discovered? That would be a failure, because they haven't given the student or each other the fullest, most complete answer to the question that she had. 
And unfortunately, we often pursue our research in disciplinary silos in similar ways, failing to share what we've learned with each other and with our students together. This happens whether we're in Catholic or secular universities. But there's a further problem. It's not just that these faculty members haven't shared what they've learned. In addition, they haven't yet thought through other issues that the students question should prompt. If they find that poorer areas in the city were more subject to devastation, they need to ask questions like, is that just? What do human beings owe each other in the first place? And if they're going to ask those questions in turn, they also have to ask about the meaning and source of human dignity, so they have a rationally defensible conception of justice. And unfortunately, the drive to specialization might obscure those questions. <coughs> and there's still more. Let's say at some point a student reasonably says, why do things like this happen in the first place? The student is not asking about building codes or institutional structures or plate tectonics or zoning laws. She's asking about the mystery of suffering. It does no good to ignore the question or dismiss it as unscientific. It's a deeply human question and deserves a human response. It involves some difficult philosophical and theological questioning. But these are questions that we all need to ask, whether we're political scientists or geologists or economists. We need to ask these kinds of questions even in order to come out on the side of informed atheism. This means that theology and philosophy are not superfluous to the university. They're essential if we're going to engage the full range and full scope of the questions human beings actually have. As Professor McIntyre reminds us, the Catholic faith proposes that human beings are seekers. And so he says, if we don't find the world astonishing, perplexing, and mystifying, we fail not as intellectuals, but more importantly, as people. Any great university, Catholic or secular, exists to help us puzzle through these questions that we have. If we inhabit silos, and these silos truncate the full range of questions that we actually have, we fail as universities because we fail to serve human beings who seek after the fullness of truth. Professor McIntyre reminds us that Catholic universities have important resources to resist those trends. <coughs> Central to his work is the claim that inquiries always proceed out of traditions. Everyone poses questions from particular vantage points. So our tradition, contested as it is, is one of our greatest resources to help us engage this full range of questions that he points us to. And this tradition teaches us a few pertinent things here. For one thing, it teaches us to have faith in reason. Faith in the Catholic tradition isn't opposed to reason. Faith enlivens reason by claiming that the world is profoundly good and eminently knowable. This tradition also tells us to have a certain faith in each other. The Catholic tradition proposes that insofar as human beings are seekers after truth, we're not satisfied with fragmentary, unrelated bits of information. In McIntyre's terms, we want an integrated understanding of the order of things. And this means we have to have renewed faith in our own intellectual desires and our ability to work to fulfill them together. These claims matter in very practical ways. They give us reasonable hope that different specialties actually have something to say to each other and are not just fragmenting and dissipating efforts. They give us the hope that when we put our different inquiries into conversation, we're naturally led to a kind of wholeness that's Catholic in the best sense of the term. All this means, as Professor McIntyre says, that Catholic universities need to learn from our secular counterparts. We need to be challenged by them. They're impressive and successful in all sorts of ways, and they have much to teach us. But we shouldn't imitate them in every way, because the model of knowing they're pursuing might fail to give us the fullness of what we deserve as seekers. So Catholic universities need the courage to do things in a distinctive way. When we structure our curricula, we have to ask whether we're giving students and faculty opportunities to learn from each other so we can work through this full range of questions that we actually have. We have to ask whether we're doing a good enough job introducing our students to the Catholic trad tradition of inquiry and the resources it has to offer. When we evaluate faculty, we can't rest with impact scores and journal rankings. We have to ask whether our standards for rank and tenure are cultivating our ability to do the kind of work that's the hallmark of wisdom and wholeness. When we structure a core curriculum, we have to make sure to give students the opportunity to do that integrated work, especially in their later years. 
Is any of that possible? <clears throat> Professor McIntyre's critics sometimes say he's pessimistic. I actually find his work wildly hopeful. He reminds us that hope is not the same as optimism or confidence. While hope is aware of what we might reasonably expect, it allows us to expect more. This is because hope rests on the assurance of God's help, which is always available. I'm hopeful about Catholic education in part because Professor McIntyre has given us a hopeful way of reframing our typical approaches. He moves us beyond stale debates and competing assertions about identity and mission. He asks Catholic universities to be great universities first and foremost. But he reminds us that grace doesn't mean prestige, it means service to those who seek. He asks us to be aware that Catholic tradition of inquiry offers resources that are sorely needed in the fragmented landscape of higher education. He asks us to be hopeful in the vocation we've chosen and shoulder it together. He asks us to share what we learn with our colleagues so we can help each other engage in rigorous inquiries across the full range of what we want to know. This is what we need to hear, so we should be grateful and hopeful. Once again, don't you think it's a wonderful tribute? As you can see, they, they worked closely together over the summer and recently in trying to pull this together into an organic whole. So you guys did a great job. Thank you. Now I, uh, I ask Father Peter Donahue, President, and Professor McIntyre to come. <laughs> Alastair McIntyre is the Reverend John A. O'Brien Senior Research Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at the University of Notre Dame. In a career spanning six decades, he has published over 30 books and hundreds of articles and reviews. Professor McIntyre has made significant contributions to the history of philosophy, moral philosophy, political theory, the philosophy of the social sciences, and the philosophy of religion. His early works include Marxism and Interpretation, The Unconscious Con Conceptual Analysis, A Short History of Ethics, and Against the Self-Images of the Age, the influential sequence of books, After Virtue, Whose Justice, Which Rationality, Three Viable Versions of Moral Inquiry, and The Dependent Rational Animals constitute the most important contemporary articulation of Aristotelianism and the sustained critique of modern moral philosophy. More recently, he has published an examination of the philosophical work of Edith Stein, set against the background of 20th century phenomenology. Professor McIntyre has held academic appointments at Oxford, Princeton, Brandeis, Wellesley, Boston University, Yale, Vanderbilt, and Duke. He has delivered the Gifford Lectures at the University of Edinburgh, the Caras Lectures at the American Philosophical Association, the Carroll Lectures at Oxford University, the Tanner Lectures and Gauss Lectures at Princeton University, and the Aquinas Lecture at Marquette University. McIntyre is a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a corresponding Fellow of the British Academy, a member of the Royal Irish Academy, and a member of the American Philosophical Society. In 2010, he was awarded the Aquinas Medal by the American Catholic Philosophical Association. Father President, I am honored to present Professor Alastair McIntyre as the inaugural <coughs> recipient of the Kivitas Dei Medal for his contributions to the Catholic intellectual tradition. On behalf of Villanova University, its faculty, its staff, and its students, we are honored to have you with us tonight, and we appreciate the great work that you have done to further Catholic intellectual tradition. Congratulations from all of us for being that hopeful teacher to many people.
Let me begin by expressing my gratitude to the university, to the members of the panel who spoke about my work, and to all of you for being here. It's always pleasing in a way to listen to people say good things about you, <laughs> but I think I ought to point out to you that anybody who deserves this particular medal will always turn out to be somebody about whom lots of people have bad things to say. <laughs> and if, if this weren't so, they wouldn't deserve the medal. Happily, I have numerous people to hand who can testify on my behalf about this. <laughs> Catholic Christians believe that God exists, that the Word was made flesh, that the bread and wine of the Eucharist become Christ's body and blood, that the Pope and the bishops teach with apostolic authority. But Catholic Christians also disbelieve, and in each particular time and place, they deny just those secular doctrines, theories, and attitudes that then and there are taken to provide grounds for rejecting the truths of the Catholic faith. To be a reflective Catholic is always to be a Catholic rather than something else. So Augustine was a Catholic rather than a Manichaean or a Neoplatonist. Pascal was a Catholic rather than a skeptic or a Cartesian. Maritain was a Catholic rather than a materialist or a Bergsonian. In what they affirmed scripturally, in the creeds and liturgically, there's that which is the same for Catholics of every generation. But the denials that are the counterparts to those affirmations vary with time, place, and culture. So how is it with us here now? To be a Catholic here and now is to reject, among other things, the claims of any version of scientific naturalism, the claim that all truths are either the truths of the natural sciences or that non-scientific truths are what they are only because the truths disclosed by the natural sciences are what they are. Scientific naturalists are therefore atheists since no finding of physics, chemistry, or biology provides them with anything like a good reason for asserting that God exists. About this latter thesis, they are, of course, right, and Catholics can happily agree that to study nature as physicists, chemists, and biologists study it is already to have excluded God from the possible objects of inquiry. But on a Catholic view, there is nonetheless that about nature which cries out for explanation. Nature is the actualization of one particular set of possibilities among indefinitely many, and a very remarkable set it is that has been actualized. The history of nature is a story of how, where once there were only particles and fields of force, there came to be cabbages, spiders, and scientific naturalists. <laughs> Given nature's starting point and the range of alternative possibilities that might have developed from it, it's an astonishing set of possibilities that have in fact been actualized. Suppose now that some Catholic, or perhaps Jewish or Islamic, follower of Aristotle were to be convinced that no set of possibilities can be actualized except by some actual agent, not a member of that set. And suppose further that such a one could not then resist the inference that nature can be what it astonishingly has been, is, and will be only because of the act of such an agent prior to and independent of nature, an agent whose powers are not limited as the powers of natural agents are limited, that is, God. Catholics, and with them many other theists, should find it difficult to treat this argument as unsound, since it's a restatement of our belief that if God did not exist, neither would nature exist. Yet to scientific naturalists, it turns out to be a wholly unpersuasive argument since it presupposes a concept of explanation that they take to be illegitimate. It's not so much that they reject the theist's answer as that they exclude the possibility of asking the theist's question. So reflective Catholics find themselves compelled to identify their own philosophical commitments, commitments that turn out to include a conception of human beings as essentially questioning and self-questioning beings, as by their nature, posing questions about themselves and their place in nature that, if scientific naturalism is true, are illegitimate. By so doing, they find themselves participants in a range of philosophical controversies, 
in which there appears to be no prospect of resolving disagreement through rational argument. So how should they respond to this situation? Newman, reflecting on the debates in which he had been involved, advanced an argument about arguments. Only in mathematics and logic, he contended, are there arguments with compelling force just by themselves as arguments. Elsewhere, what compelling force a particular argument has depends upon background beliefs and attitudes that individuals bring with them to the evaluation of this or that argument. It's these, what Newman called that large outfit of existing thoughts, principles, likings, desires, and hopes which make me what I am, it's these that determine what weight a particular individual gives to this or that type of consideration. It's differences in these that underlie radical philosophical disagreements. So we may ask, what then are the underlying attitudes and beliefs that distinguish someone whose understanding of human agents is compatible with the truth of the Catholic faith and someone for whom this is not so? The answer that I propose is this, that the key differences arise from the ways in which each understands the narrative of her or his life. Consider how someone may ask, prospectively or retrospectively, if that life is going well or badly, if so far it has gone well or badly, and what part she or he has played in making it go well or badly. There would be no story to tell if it were not the case that at crucial points it has been, is, and will be up to the agent to determine how things go. And the question of how things have gone with one so far and of how one must act if they are to go well in the future are among those that human agents can't avoid putting to themselves. But notice that they are among the questions that consistent scientific naturalists have to judge illegitimate. For even to ask them presupposes the possibility that human goodness and human evil make a significant difference to how the world goes, that human choices affect changes in nature changes not to be explained by the interactions of fundamental particles. To be a Catholic, then, is to be among those who understand both their own lives and those of others in terms of narratives whose structures can be epic, tragic, comic, or farcical in respect of the relationships between us, the subjects of those narratives, and the goods that we pursue or fail to pursue. One prerequisite for achieving goods rather than evils is ruthless truthfulness in recounting the story so far. Why is such truthfulness so difficult? It's because if our stories are told truthfully, they're stories of our fallenness. And it's part of our fallenness to be unwilling to acknowledge our fallenness. <laughs> so to be a Catholic is to share Newman's thought that if we view this world as it is, we are bound to conclude, I quote, that either there is no creator or this living society of men is in a true sense discarded from his presence. And the stories that we tell about ourselves are truthful only if they present not only the human world in general, but also our particular lives as the lives of fallen human beings. Yet now we have to note that understanding human life in these terms is not peculiar to Catholics, that it finds, for example, extraordinary dramatic expression in the portrayal of human beings from whom God is wholly absent, that we owe to Samuel Beckett, the great tragic voice of the 20th century. What am I to do? What shall I do? What should I do? In my situation, how proceed? Asks the narrator of Beckett's The Unnameable. By apparia pure and simple, or by affirmations and negations invalidated as uttered, or sooner or later. Generally speaking, there must be other shifts, Otherwise, it would be quite hopeless. But it is quite hopeless. So Beckett's characters live out their truthful hopelessness in a kind of narrative atheism that puts the Catholic faith to the question, both intellectually and imaginatively. And reflective Catholics have to acknowledge that they are Catholics rather than those for whom Beckett's dramatic vision of the human condition has the last word. The stories that Catholics tell about their own lives and about those of others are stories of fallenness, but not of hopelessness. And this because those stories presuppose the truth of the biblical narrative are indeed intelligible only in terms of the biblical narrative. 
The two examples that I've given so far of contemporary Catholic unbelief are rejection of the seductions both of scientific naturalism and of Samuel Beckett's temptingly tragic view of the world are perhaps sufficient, even if barely so, to illustrate two more general theses. The first is that these rejections and denials add significant content to our Catholic beliefs. To believe in God nowadays is in part to deny the truth of scientific naturalism. To believe in our redemption is in part to deny that in Samuel Beckett's vision, which makes hope an illusion. A second thesis is that it is out of our particular quarrels with those works of the intellect and the imagination that the Catholic culture of the last century comes to be. The philosophy that emerges from our quarrel with scientific naturalism, the poetic storytelling that emerges from our quarrels with the literature of despair, the philosophy, say, of a Robert Sokolowski or of a Maritain or of a Gabriel Marcel, the storytelling, say, of a Flannery O'Connor or of a Claudel, or of a Graham Greene. As I suggested earlier, the alternative and rival forms of belief with which Catholics need to engage vary from age to age. And so, therefore, do the quarrels that Catholics have with such beliefs. It follows that the beliefs of reflective Catholics also vary, and that the Catholic culture that emerges from the quarrels with one such set of alternative and rival forms of belief may be very different from that which emerges in other contexts. There have been and are Catholic cultures, not Catholic culture. But there is, of course, one unchanging Catholic faith, that which is, has been, and will be one and the same in doctrine and in worship. And since it's because of their relationship to what's one and the same in that faith that Catholic cultures in all their variety are called Catholic, more needs to be said about how faith informs our cultural projects. Begin from what I said about fallenness as understood by Newman and by Beckett. Beckett's imaginative world is not open to the possibility of hope. Newman's is, and it is so because the narrative of his life, as he recounts it in the Apologia, presupposes both the truth of the biblical narrative and that the history of the Catholic Church is continuous with is the same history as the history of our redemption as it's narrated in Scripture. Reconsider in this light the relationship of our quarrels with scientific naturalism to those with Beckett's tragic vision. It shouldn't surprise us that a rational commitment to the metaphysics of theism and an ability to understand one's life in terms of the narrative of Scripture should be closely related, since someone lacking either of these would be bound to have a defective conception of the principal actors in that narrative, on the one hand of God, on the other of ourselves. If we are to think of God as he is, then we have to understand him metaphysically, both as creator and first cause, omnipresent and providential sustainer of the natural order, and in narrative terms, as one who intervenes here and not there, who addresses Moses but not Socrates, who spoke his definitive words to us in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, not in Irish or German, who both ordains laws of nature and works miracles. If we are to think of ourselves as we are, then we have to understand ourselves not only as estranged from God by our rebellious wills, but also as completely and inadequately human until we are reconciled to him through the redemptive work of God incarnate in Jesus. Our narratives are incomplete and indeed not fully intelligible until we bring them into relation to the gospel narrative, the narrative of scripture. Because this is so, we found ourselves at yet another point in conflict with the contemporary secularizing mind, this time in the arenas of historical inquiry and debate. For us, much is at stake in the scholarly arguments about biblical texts and history. Consider the remarkable contrasts between the Jesus of whom we can know very little of Freda and his 20th century followers, the Jewish Jesus of Geza Vermes, the egalitarian peasant Jesus of J.D. Crossan, the eschatological Jesus of Schweitzer, and the Jesus who emerges from N.T. Wright's magisterial trilogy. In which Jesus are we to believe? Among these contenders, 
Only the last is recognizable as the Jesus of whom the Catholic Church speaks, or rather the Jesus who speaks to us through the Catholic Church. If that Jesus is the object of our faith, it can't be only because of our judgment concerning the superiority of Wright's historical scholarship, crucially important as that is, but must be also, and primarily, because we take God himself to have authorized the apostles and the Catholic bishops as their successors to teach the truth concerning his self-revelation in Jesus and in his saving work. Here then, as elsewhere, the commitments that are part of a reflective Catholic culture, whether philosophical, imaginative, or as in this case, historical, are different from, but also inseparable from, the sacramental commitments of faith. So, how then are they related? They're related in and through the activity of prayer, both the prayer that brings our praise, our gratitude, and our sense of our needs before God, and the prayer in which we learn to attend silently to him, listening rather than speaking. For the only expression of both sets of commitments, cultural and theological, is prayer. So prayer is integral to the activities that constitute any Catholic culture. How we pray is how we are. Three aspects of Catholic prayer are peculiarly relevant. The first finds expression in John Chrysostom's gloss on Paul's injunction to pray constantly. I quote, It's possible to offer fervent prayer even while walking in public or strolling along or seated in your shop, while buying or selling, or even while cooking. Indeed, our everyday activities can be a form of prayer, something that Benedict teaches us with respect to manual labor and Dominic with respect to study. Secondly, prayer, conversation with God, doesn't always take the forms of conventional piety. Abraham engaged in dialectical argument with God, designed to convince God that he was in danger of acting unjustly. Job cursed God, upsetting those proto-theologians, Job's comforters, but not upsetting God in the slightest. <laughs> Teresa of Avila, on a particularly bad day, remarked to God that if this was how he treated his friends, it was small wonder that he had so few. <laughs> Finally, we learn from both John of the Cross and Dorothy Day that progress in the discipline of prayer is evidenced not by the vagaries of mystical experience, but by growth in charity, a charity that is more but never less than justice. A would-be Catholic culture fails in Catholicity if it doesn't take this thought seriously. So let me turn with these thoughts in mind to an instructive example of a Catholic mind at work in the world of culture in another time of place, in the France of Charles Péguy, between the years 1908, when he returned to the Catholic faith of his childhood, and 1914, when he died on the battlefield. Born at Orléans in 1873, Péguy found himself in adult life like his contemporaries of the Third Republic, morally, politically, and religiously defined by a single line of division between a right-wing establishment, a Catholic, clerical, and conservative upper class and bourgeoisie, defenders of the economic order of capitalism, and a secularizing, anti-clerical, radical, or socialist left-wing establishment, each with its own partisan version of French history. Peguy, as an atheist and socialist, identified with the latter, seeing in the right-wing establishment the enemies of the harmonious city that he aspired to restore. But when he became a Catholic, although he had by then learned to distrust the factionalism and bureaucracy of the Socialist Party, he remained as much at odds with the right as before. For he now defined himself as Catholic rather than someone definable by the antithesis between Catholic, conservative, and secular socialist. And he gave expression to this self-definition both through metaphysics and through poetic narrative, a retelling of the French Catholic story as at once Catholic and monarchical and socialist and republican. A great philosophy, Peggy wrote, is not that which passes final judgments, it is that which introduces uneasiness. The French of his age, whether Catholic conservatives or secularizing socialists, needed to be disquieted and disturbed. 
What France had come to lack was a shared sense of the mystery of things, a sense formally communicated through the traditions of the common people, a sense that had been displaced by a politics of conflicting slogans and programs. It was not that a politics of programs was not needed. Modern societies have inflicted deprivation and destitution on the poor, and from these the poor have to be rescued by a politics of justice rooted in charity. But they and others too have to be rescued from impoverished notions of what it is to be French and Catholic, of what it is to be the heirs both of Jeanne d'Arc and of the revolution of 1789. So Peggy took on a task at once political and historical and poetic, one that would allow the French to understand that by failing to live as Catholic Christians, they had failed to be French, and that God was now calling them through the French-speaking voices that speak in Peggy's poetry, the voices of Jeanne d'Arc and of Our Lady and of God himself, to become once again Christian and once again French. Even the thought that God may be French is likely to be as disconcerting to contemporary Americans <laughs> as the thought that God is Jewish was to the Catholic anti-Semites of Peggy's day. What is likely to be disconcerting to all of us here and now is Peggy's thought that a necessary prelude to inadequate politics may be on the one hand metaphysics, on the other a poetry that is a form of prayer. Poetry and prayer well designed as an antidote to the corruption of political speech. This was a thought that found extraordinary creative expression, not only in Peggy's poetry, but also in the Catholic culture that it helped to generate, the culture of Marcel and Claudel, of Bernanos and Moriac, of Mounier and Maritain, of Poulon, and most strikingly perhaps of de Gaulle. Is it perhaps a thought for us too? And what would it be to find application for this thought in contemporary terms? We, like Peggy, inhabit a politically polarized culture, albeit one very different from his. Ours is one in which the idioms of a vulgarized liberalism and those of a vulgarized conservatism, idioms that are the offspring of an alliance between public intellectuals and advertising agencies, have combined to degrade political speech and corrupt political action. It's perhaps an unexpected thought that a Catholic response to this political condition should be to begin from reflection on metaphysics, on narrative, on poetry, and on prayer. But it may be that this is the thought that he, we hear now should be taking very seriously. And if I were to develop why this is so, I would be keeping you here perhaps for three hours initially, but really for three weeks or three years. <laughs> so I break off at this point. <laughs> And I want to thank the four panelists uh, 
um, for being up here and spending their time. And I am very grateful that you found your way out of the dome and uh, followed the light <laughs> to here where you can aspire to greatness. <laughs> so uh, thank you all for uh, your contribution. And uh, Dr. McIntyre, for your academic career and your writings, as well as your evolution and your self-assessment of your own faith, you have demonstrated the pursuit of truth and beauty and goodness in many different ways. And in a world where we memorialize people for far less, I am particularly grateful that we are elevating these ideals today. Thank you for what you have done, for how you have helped this community reflect on our own process of dealing with the Catholic intellectual tradition. Thank you for your many writings, for your many lectures, and for your demonstration of your own faith in everything that you've done. As I mentioned earlier, Villanova is extremely grateful that you have come here to join us today. And we thank you for everything that you have done, what you do now, and what we pray you will continue to do to further the Catholic intellectual tradition. We are honored to have you. Thank you. When I ask Dr. Catherine Getty to give us a final benediction. Loving God, let us not tire in seeking you. Let us not forget your presence among us. But place in our hearts a passion for your truth, a trust in your goodness, and a love of your beauty. Renew and enliven our minds so that we may use your every gift to us in the service of the reign of God, which you have wonderfully proclaimed. May we discern your truth with humility, speak your good news with eloquence, and persevere in living out your wisdom. Bless our work, bless our celebrations. Open our eyes and hearts to those who suffer and are forgotten. Direct all that we do and are to the benefit of your creation. And let us give you praise, honor, and thanksgiving for your unending goodness. In your name we pray. Amen. We have a lovely reception prepared for everyone, so please enjoy. Carry on the conversation. <laughs>